Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, January 13th, 2015. This is a regular meeting of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Good morning. Let the record reflect. Commissioner Soboroff, Madison, Figueroa Villa, Kim, and Salzman are present, and we have a quorum. Number one on the agenda, commission comments. Commissioner comments. Commissioner comments. Commissioner comments. Oh, let's move on. Okay, we do have two public comment cards on item number one. Okay. We have um, Michael Hunt and Tiara Mora. Are the people here? Mr. Hunt, Tiara Mora, no, they're not. We will move on okay, to- Okay, let's move on. Item number two, the report of the Chief of Police, Chief Beck. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Commissioners. My report will be brief. First, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Soberoff and uh, Commissioner Santa Figueroa Villa uh, for coming to the Martin Luther King breakfast that we hosted at Town and Gown on Saturday. It was a great, uh, a great event uh, where we had a, a wonderful uh, keynote speaker, Andre Barat, who's very well known to the to this commission in the Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, also in attendance were Jackie Lacey and and uh, Jim McDonald and many other uh, leaders in Los Angeles. It was a it was a great event. It was our uh, sixth annual, and one I one I look forward to every year. Uh, I'm going to uh, the mayor and I had our uh, end of year uh, uh, crime press conference, and also talked about strategies for the coming year yesterday. So I'm not going to address crime today because the 2015 numbers are too raw, and uh, we just did the perf we just did the conference on uh, yesterday for 14. I will talk about deployment. We have 9,896 uh, police officers on payroll. We plan on starting a class at the end of the month. That should put us over the, the 9,900 mark. We have 2,718 civilian personnel, 398 reserves, 372 specialist volunteers, 63 chaplains, and 6,119 cadets in our program. And that concludes my report. Any questions of the chief? Thank you, Chief. We do have one public comment card. We have Mr. Ted Hayes. <clears throat> Morning, Mr. Hayes. Morning. I'm a little disappointed with the Chief's comments because the news is rattling with the rise of, rise of crime in L.A. It's on every radio station. Uh, murder, homicide, rape, everything. And that's not an outstanding event. But what I really want to talk about is the event of last week. Uh, when the chief met with um, those who contended black lives matter. Now, who determines whether life matters or not? A C-47 landed uh, in the bay. There were caskets covered with American flags. And the president of the United States said, I don't want the people to ever see that again. And so those lives of those soldiers did not matter. Donald Rumsfeld was challenge because so many soldiers were dying and he said really that's what soldiers do they die uh, that was down Runsfield's exit because those lives didn't matter apparently so I would hope that the chief points out that last week this place was shut down I could not get inside because of people who thought black lives matter but we have to reflect on the fact that the president's belt the military lives didn't matter enough for the American people to at least see their corpses in a casket with a flag draped across it. And then Rumsfeld says that's what soldiers do. They die. Well, I was a soldier. I, as you can see, I did not die. And I think the military personnel, their, their lives do matter. Even if we don't get taxed to pay for the wars that they're fighting in, even if we don't suffer any kind of rationing because of the wars that they're fighting in, those lives matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again for your guidance on our flags. We've got that squared away now. Okay. Item number three on the agenda, the report of the Executive Director, Mr. T. Fink. Morning, Mr. President, members of the Commission. Uh, two brief items for the public's information. Uh, there will be two special Commission meetings this week. Uh, to receive public input on the officer on body cameras and the development of the department policy governing their use. The first meeting will be tomorrow night, uh, January 14th at 6.30 p.m., and that will be at Green Meadows Recreation Center, 
431 East 89th Street in Los Angeles. The next meeting will be on Thursday night, January 15th at 6.30 p.m. And that will be at the AGBU Manugian Demergian School at 6844 Oakdale Avenue in Canoga Park. Also, Wait, Mr. Uh, Mr. T. Fank. Yes, sir. Okay, because this is just, the, again, the reverse. Get, make sure on Wednesday night the meeting is in Canoga Park? No, sir. Wednesday night the meeting is at Green Meadows Recreation Center at 431 East 89th Street. Okay, and Thursday? Thursday is in Canoga Park at the AGBU Manugian Demergian School, 6844 Oakdale Avenue, Canoga Park. Got it. Thank you. Also, as the commission has regularly scheduled community meetings in the various council districts, our next community meeting is going to be on February 3rd, 2015 at 6.30 p.m., and that will be hosted by Council Member Mitch O'Farrell in Council District 13, and that will be at the Sandra Cisneros Learning Academy, 1018 Mohawk Street in Los Angeles, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Item number four on the agenda, the report of the Inspector General, Mr. Bustamante. Uh, thank you, Commissioners. I have nothing to report today. Thank you. Item number five consists of information items and filed items relative to noise variances and special event permits submitted for the period ending January 9, 2015. <coughs> item number six, presentations. Do we have any presentations? Not today. Thank you. Item number seven is consent agenda items. These items are considered to be routine and uncontroversial, upon which the board is provided with adequate information for approval without inquiry or discussion. Would a commissioner wish to pull an item as special? 7A, 7B. No, I'll move approval of both with thanks to the donors. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We're now on item number eight, regular <coughs> agenda items. Would a commissioner wish to pull an item as special for a discussion? Eight, eight A is a verbal, um, 8B or 8C? Uh, I'd be interested in hearing from the department on item 8C. I move approval of item 8B. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we have A and C. Okay, we will begin with 8A, verbal presentation and update from the commanding officer and community police advisory board representative regarding community initi initiated problem solving, crime strategies, and other pro programs and goals within the Devonshire area. We'll get you out of here in time to get back in rush hour traffic, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. Good morning, uh, members of the commission and chief. Thank you for the opportunity to come in and brief uh, you this morning uh, on the engagement of the Community Police Advisory Board and how they are an essential component in the Devonshire community. So to do that this morning, uh, I'm going to call upon my co-chair, uh, Mr. Larry Stern, to deliver that for you. Thank you, Captain Pitcher. Good morning, President Soboroff, members of the Police Commission, Chief Beck, Executive Director T. Fank, and Inspector General Bustamante. As Captain Pitcher conveyed, my name is Larry Stern, CPAB co-chair of Devonshire area. I want to begin by thanking you for the opportunity to appear before you to present Devonshire CPAB's annual update from 2014, along with our upcoming goals our board will be undertaking for 2015. In our prior annual presentation, a major issue addressed was crime in vacant foreclosed properties and our suggestions on how the department can effectively implement proper enforcement procedures to curtail its escalation during our economic rebound. The crimes associated with these properties have included vandalism, squatting, and acting as a haven for drug dealers and gang members. Aside from these direct crimes occurring, it has also affected the quality of life in subject neighborhoods, along with the diminishment of property values in that immediate area. With the help of Councilman Englander, the support of Deputy Chief Viegas, and implementation by Captain Pitcher, I'm most pleased to report that this long-awaited enforcement plan has now been in place throughout all of 2014. With Devonshire receiving ongoing reports of the foreclosure registry via Palantir Technologies through the Los Angeles Housing Authority database, this information is funneled to the recipient enforcement detail, volunteer surveillance team, the Devonshire senior lead officers, and their respective basic car units, combining the following steady enforcement strategy taking place. One, the recidivist enforcement detail is assigned to monitor foreclosed locations, conducting periodic sweeps and parole checks for known career criminals squatting at these locations. Two, the volunteer surveillance team conducts weekly random checks at foreclosed locations to verify that the locations are vacant and checking foreclosure status with the listing agents of those properties, which resulted in 369 vacant status checks throughout 2014. 
Senior lead officers then do a follow-up on the foreclosed location if there are signs of squatters and illegal activities. And finally, the senior lead officers also monitor and check foreclosed locations on a weekly basis, keeping in touch with neighbors and alerting the local residents via social media about foreclosed locations that should remain vacant or report the first signs of any illegal activities taking place, followed up by basic car units providing extra patrol at foreclosed locations during nighttime hours looking for inhabitants and or associated illegal activities. Our board feels that the above four areas of enforcement have proven to be a most valuable part in this type of crime curtailment, resulting in the positive achievement through December 14th by a drop of 9% in residential burglaries in the Devonshire area from 2013, which in turn contributed to 448 less property crime victims throughout this period, once again proving the context of the broken window theory. On the subject of criminal activity, our board is most pleased to have been informed that Devonshire area is still continuing a steady course in crime reduction throughout 2014, equating to a 4.2% reduction through year end. This reduction continues the four-year trend beginning in 2011 with a 14.8% reduction, followed by a 4% reduction in 2012, and a 10.4% reduction at the time of our 2013 presentation on November 19th. Under the command of Captain Pitcher, Captain Marino, and Lieutenant Torsney, the fine men and women of the Devonshire area have once again made our community one of the safest areas to live and to work in the city of Los Angeles. In addition to crime containment and awareness regarding residential the residential population of Devonshire, we strongly believe that the estimated 10,000 small to medium-sized businesses in our community are of equal importance. With much of these size businesses not in the staffing position to physically attend <coughs> business watch meetings, modern day technology is now able to alleviate this problem with CPAB's formation of e-business watch at Devonshire. Spearheaded by CPAB member Mr. Dennis DeShaw and under the supervision of the Devonshire command staff, the website is in the final phases of construction with a vast business database being comprised by the senior lead officers spreading the word to local business population along with the obtaining of the email addresses of these businesses through our various chambers of commerce in the division and the business database contained in Council District 12. It is planned to send monthly newsletters containing crime trends and safety procedures to all businesses in this database, along with doing email blasts in the interim should the need arise from any heightened criminal activity or emergency situation. This will be an interactive and fully manned website so that businesses can also convey any criminal activity needing to be brought to Devonshire's attention. It is anticipated that beta testing should be complete in February, with the website being fully functional for launching as of March. In last year's presentation, our board addressed the need to interface with today's youth and to coincide with Assistant Chief Pacinger's vision of a means to guide this generation in the proper direction to a sound future. With that said, the Devonshire CPAB was at the time most fortunate to have had Ms. Donna Smith at the time as a member and board secretary. Ms. Smith had made her lifetime career as a school administrator and former principal at the Los Angeles Unified School District. With her long-term deep-rooted relationships with key personnel at the district level, she had instituted a plan in having periodic roundtable meetings with these contacts to receive direct input on today's issues facing the various grade levels of the student body and working on divergent programs together with our board to help maintain our children on the right track. Ms. Smith had formed a committee within our board to partake in this program and began conducting these meetings with school district officials sharing student body information with Devonshire detectives and the juvenile car unit. Unfortunately, after many years of dedicated service to our CPAB, Ms. Smith could not continue these efforts and needed to retire from our board due to health issues. She succumbed. <coughs> she will be greatly missed. However, when one door closes, another opens. With our board most pleased to have welcomed our first teen CPAB member, Mr. Sam Dobry. Hmm. It has been said that the apple does not fall far from the tree, since Sam's father, Mr. Mike Dobry, not only is a highly respected CPAB member, but also contained to the Devonshire website as Devonshire's outstanding community member. Sam is a very mature and focused sophomore at Granada Hills Charter High School, maintaining a 4.0 grade point average. Our board looks forward to his valuable input regarding issues of concern amongst his peers and receiving information regarding areas needing containment by the department. 2015 marks the second year since inception that each of our seven CPAP co-chairs from the Valley Bureau have met in two-month intervals to exchange ideas and address the issues of concern in the demographic area. Each of the co-chairs also rotate the hosting of these meetings in their respective division. Under the concurrence of Assistant Chief Viegas, we are proud to announce the first Valley Bureau CPAP Summit tentatively planned for Saturday, March 21st from 9 a.m. through noon. The venue for this event will take place at the Warner Center Marriott thanks to the relationship formed by Officer Robert Rothman of Operations Valley Bureau with the host general manager, the hotel's general manager, excuse me.
With the recent widespread volatility issues facing us, both in our nation and globally, the main focus being addressed at the Valley Bureau Summit will be that of emergency preparedness. <coughs> Additionally, with the recent command staff transitions and promotions throughout Valley Bureau, the summit would be the opportune time for each of the attending CPEB members to meet the Valley's commanding officers. At this time, and on behalf of my fellow Valley co-chairs, I would like to extend an invitation to each of you to attend this event and we'll follow up with each of you with each of your offices upon the date becoming definitive. On a sidebar, and due to the recent act, recent current events involving protests taking place throughout the many cities of our nation, it is of my seasoned opinion after 21 years of being a CPEB member and co-chair, along with being intimately involved with the department, that the city of Los Angeles should be ext extremely proud of its highly successful model in community-based policing. In the interest of your valuable time, additional details of the items presented this morning, along with other accomplishments throughout this year that were not addressed due to time constraints, will be gladly furnished should the Commission so desire. In closing, on behalf of my fellow board members, I want to express our sincere thanks for including the Devonshire CPAP's annual update and future goals in this morning's agenda, along with wishing each of you and your families the best of health and happiness throughout the new year. Good speech. Uh, it was only two minutes. <laughs> I have uh, a couple of questions and um, comments. First of all, um, the idea that you're coming to us um, with solutions, not problems, not impossible problems, um, with, um, with um, support of the uh, officers in the community um, is welcome. Um, the second thing is I want to ask you about your board. Um, I'm happy to hear that your your board is that you're going getting the, you've got the younger community in, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me about your commitment to diversity on your board and uh, the future of of your board and your board recruitment because you, the community that you serve is becoming more and more diverse. Well, I, I would say as far as diversity goes, we probably have a, a good show of what the community represents. We have uh, many uh, business stakeholders that have come aboard, and uh, most recently and noteworthy, uh, Mr. John Morris uh, with the District Attorney's Office is going to be, has become a member of our CPAP, so we're real happy about that. Uh, we've got people in the real estate profession, uh, small businesses. Uh, we did have, as I said, Donna Smith, who was with the LA Unified School District. So we do have a pretty varied uh, membership. We have about 25 people, and unfortunately, uh, you know, it's almost like a restaurant menu where 10% of the items on the menu bring in 90% of the business. So we're, we're trying to uh, get more of our membership to partake in the activities that we're trying to get accomplished. Good. Any other questions, comments? Gentlemen, anything you want to say? Good job. Thank you. Well, Thank we you, do Mr. Have Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for what you. you're doing. I like your, the, the, uh, the um, best practices meetings you're going to have in the Valley itself. And then that comes into the, the big best practices meetings that happen with CPABs. So this is a, it's a very important issue for Los Angeles and public safety here, something that sets us a, a, apart. Thanks, guys. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. We everybody. do have one public comment card. We have Mr. Ted Hayes. I'd like to inform the members of the Devonshire Division how fortunate they are because in our division, one of my divisions, um, we don't have a <coughs> CPAB that functions that well because it only meets once a month. But we meet weekly, every Wednesday, a group called Cease Fire. Another prominent group mingled with them is <coughs> called Cry No More. I think you know where that goes. The homicides that take place. There are officers from the 77th Div Division, even the captain came down to our meeting one time, and they're welcome. They're like one of the family, so to speak. Uh, Devonshire doesn't have that problem. I knew that problem was going to intensify when 109 took place, uh, when transitioning took place, and they began to release people from prison. That's why the crime rate has exploded, because of the inmates who come from prison to a felons go back to their lifestyle of crime. Now, one thing I'd like to say about crime, uh, uh, two days ago in my neighborhood, at least three blocks away from where I lived, there was a killing, a drive-by on the corner. The memorial is there, the candles and the 
photographs and the flowers. <coughs> but more importantly, the blood splatters are still on the sidewalk. We washed our sidewalk clear of the chalk, but the sidewalk still has the blood splatters of this victim. We contract various groups to clean these kind of horrific things up. Get out there on 59th and Crenshaw and clean up the blood splatters, please. Thank you. We're now on item 8C, Department's report dated January 9, 2015, <coughs> relative to the Los Angeles Police Department's personnel selection criteria and process audit. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Jeffrey Phillips with uh, Internal Audits Inspections Division. Uh, commissioners, uh, and of course, right next to me, Chief uh, MacArthur. Uh, commissioners, before you have the personnel selection criteria and process audit, and just to recap, uh, this audit has brought uh, has been brought before you on uh, two occasions. The first time uh, it came before you, there was uh, some more information that you uh, requested uh, on table number seven. The second time we uh, brought the audit forward, uh, there was more information that you uh, requested pertaining to those boards that uh, were determined to be diverse, and so. Uh, what we've done is we've gone ahead and added that information uh, with uh, addenda. Uh, addenda A, uh, now attached to the report, uh, provides a uh, breakdown of the rank uh, diversity. Uh, and if you notice, most of those boards were conducted by uh, personnel at the rank of lieutenant and captain, uh, by and large. Um, in addenda item number B, you have the breakdown of the board's uh, by ethnicity and at the very bottom of the table with, uh, with the information uh, synthesized. And item number C, or uh, addenda item C, has the breakdown by gender uh, and also a table with uh, the information that's synthesized. And um, that, that's the addition to, to, uh, to the report. Questions? Thank you for the thoroughness. It, it helps a lot, and it, I think it, um, it, it speaks to achieving the goal of having the diversity in the selection panel, so I appreciate that. Totally separate from the addenda tables, though, I have a question about objective number three, the review of the selected candidate's disciplinary history. It's on page five of 12. And it says that, if, I, if I'm following this clearly, it says that in these instances that the candidates' um, record on discipline, the team's report, wasn't necessarily included. Does that mean it wasn't consulted or it's just that that checkbox wasn't there? But when we did the evaluation, when all the information came in, they did not check the box um, Everybody had been reviewed, and then we have, of course, the follow-up, the, the safety net, is once somebody is on a transfer, there's a mandate that, that, mandate that they review it ver through with a, an action item. So we did double-check with, worked with OO, because most of them came out of OO, and they had all done it. They just did not check the box, and it goes back to those reminders and then making sure their adjutants are, are making sure as they package everything up and send it to personnel that we're, we're checking those boxes. Yep. So, but we did do a follow-up on all of that. Okay. And this is just that at that point it wasn't checked. Correct. Not that it hadn't been conducted. That is correct. Okay. And, and audit division is very good about that because we put check boxes in there to help people, but also oftentimes we have the ebb and flow of nobody being able to be transferred and then all of a sudden a lot. So we believe that some of that had to do with the fact that there was numerous packages coming through. Uh, but OO has been reminded, as has everybody, and uh, we we hope that that number is a better number next time it's audited. Yes, th this time period was where uh, the city went ahead and or the department eased up on being able to upgrade. So there was hundreds of applicants. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. I appreciate the report and the thoroughness. Then <coughs> helps clear up any of the questions I had. Thank you, uh, Saltzman. 
I agree. I thank you. Uh, I know this has been a unusually difficult, but I think you've answered all my questions and appreciate the responsiveness. So. We're hoping three times a charm. <laughs> I think they would appreciate a, uh, a motion for approval by none other than Commissioner Saltzman. I would move <laughs> approval of this item. And Thank and you. Commissioner Madison would second. So that, second you, you, okay. if that ain't the stamp of approval, I don't know what it is. All Thank in you favor? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We're now on item number nine, public comment period. We have nine comment cards. We begin with Ben Fordson, Tiara Mora, Ted Hayes, and Michael Hunt. Ben Fortson. Morning. And I uh, just want to be clear that um, all uh, speakers will be limited to <laughs> two minutes. Good morning, sir. How you doing? Um, I have uh, evidence that um, LAPD working with the city attorney's office, 100 uh, West Street here, uh, this guy's up in, upstairs working with the... Uh, can you speak in the microphone, sir? I can't really hard Working to hear. with the city attorney's office, completely falsified and fabricated um, criminal charges against me. I have, a, I have conclusive evidence of that. I filed a complaint, and it was, it was covered up and um, withheld from internal affairs. They didn't know about it until two years later, over two years. I went to internal affairs, and... Um, November 5th, 2014, to find out why these people are not being held accountable for committing a 182 against me. It conspired. When I went down there to find out, I was informed by the um, Sergeant uh, McCool and Sergeant um, Torres that the Internal Affairs didn't know anything about the case. It was nowhere in the system. They searched for two days. There's a clear cover-up going on. You must know about it, Chief Beck. I got, there's five officers involved in this. Five. And there's a cover-up going on. I gave a, I gave a um, statement of facts to Officer Ward to give to Captain Grimes. And now all of a sudden, it's lost so he can forward it over to um, internal affairs. I would, there's a cover-up going on. It's not a thorough investigation happening here, <laughs> an unbiased, thorough investigation. I would like to speak with someone and show them the evidence I have. This is, let's build confidence with the black community. Thank you, sir. Commander can I show somebody this? Commander Mason will speak. Who? Tiara Mora. Good morning, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me. My name is Tiara Mora. This is my first time introducing myself to you all and I will learn how to properly address you all as I get to know you, if that's all right. You're doing fine. Thank you. First, I would like to speak on the topics uh, within my two minutes regarding the significant incidents, crime statistics, recruitment uh, and of officers and the department personnel strength. Due to the gridlock of the Pacific Division, we think that Captain Brian Johnson and Al Berka have been there quite a long time. We're appreciative. We're looking forward to updating the Pacific Division training manuals and public relations, which is due. Our crime statistics are wobbling, and we are experiencing a volume of profiling and biased policing. We, the community, will be happy to assist. If you would invite me again to speak on a more elaborated presentation of ways we can assist, I'd be happy to come back and do so again. On a personal statement uh, from me growing up and why I'm here presenting, I drive through cities, I see smiles, I see frowns, I am seeing the unanimous similarity that there, are, uh, there is a reoccurring compulsion for love in greetings to people, in opening doors of businesses at dawn, in courtesy of others, in the safe magnificence of the community and the people we dedicate to what we love. So let's give ourselves a city to love. Let us uh, clearly define and theorize on public relations and this I believe would lead us to a clear state of mind and clear state of mind leads to courage and ambition. So if you would invite me to come again, I would. My name is Tiara Mora. Thank you, Tiara. Thank you also. Mr. Ted Hayes. 
when <coughs> U.S. Attorney General Janet Reno was challenged about the women and children who lost their lives at the Waco event, she said it was collateral damage. Timothy McBay had revenge, responded to that. When he blew up Oklahoma, he said it was all collateral damage despite the fact that children were inside that building. When it comes to terror, let's understand someone initiates these things and someone responds. I cannot tell you where you will find in the Quran that if you blaspheme the name of the prophet, the punishment, the revenge is death. It has nothing to do with the Bill of Rights, which protects people from the government in this country when it comes to censorship. That's what they are obligated to do if they follow the commandment. So when you blaspheme the prophet, you're asking for the consequences. Now, the president should not have been there. George, uh, Ronald Reagan got shot, leaving the hotel, going to a car. No, the president of the United States should not be walking in a crowd of a million people in the streets. No. Anyway, let's understand that it's not an act of terror against France. It wouldn't be an act of terror against the United States if some publication blasphemed the, the prophet. I don't know whether there's a concordance that tells you where you'll find these things about what you must do if the prophet Muhammad is blasphemed. But that's the fact, and no one wants to discuss that. So be alert. You cannot say anything you want to say simply because the Bill of Rights says you may. You can't say it because some people may violently object to what you say and do what you're obligated to do to respond. Michael Hunt, followed by Michelle X, Todd Griffin, and Davon. Good morning, 2015 Police Commission. My name is Michael Hunt. I've been arrested probably about 64 times. I'm a Ninth Circuit winner, and I try and improve the city of Los Angeles. The train has wrecked at Pacific Division. Please fix it, <coughs> bring back my jobs. Um, bring back some good people to the Pacific Division, and let's keep up the good work. Let's get the training manuals corrected and things like that. Um, let's make it happen for Venice this year, 2015. I hate, I mean, I love purple, but I hate red, so let's try and fix the problem this year. And you know who I'm directing that to, sir. Morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Michelle. Um, I'm from Youth Justice Coalition, um, but I'm also here as a concerned citizen. I also have my daughter, Courtney, here. Um, and I'll keep this short uh, because when I uh, went to the website to look up the public comments, um, I seen that you guys or whoever's editing the public comments had deleted over an hour of public comments. Um, and I really think that the public comment uh, recording is very critical um, and to please not edit that um, and leave it as is. Um, but I just wanted to urge the board to have transparency with the community and to release um, all the specific information on the individuals who have been murdered by LAPD because currently we are receiving all our statistics and our body counts from, from the morgue. Um, and I also want to um, urge that you guys urge Jackie Lacey to open up, um, I mean, to, um, to appoint a special prosecutor to investigate um, all these officer-involved cases or officer-involved cases of uh, misconduct and murder um, and to just try to do your jobs better. Thank you. Morning. Good morning, Commission. My name is Todd Griffin. I'm an organizer with Black Lives Matters. We've been encamped outside the LAPD for two weeks calling for justice for the family of Ezel Ford. And I'm here today and I want to share with you a quick history lesson. I'm a student of history and I want to share with you a brief history of the emergence of one of the first police departments in the United States. Um, in the 1820s, you had an a, attempted slave rebellion in the city of Charleston, South Carolina, where the people had organized under leader Denmark Vesey to try to liberate the people to try to free their brothers and sisters from bondage. And the attempt failed, the movement was infiltrated, and out of fear, out of an attempt to 
retain the system of slavery. The South Carolina legislature established one of the country's first police departments through the Municipal Guard Act of 1823, and it established the, the Charleston Police Department. And so fast forward to today, when we're looking at a country where every 28 hours a black person is killed by a police officer, by a security guard, or by a self-appointed vigilante, it's no surprise that our police departments are often not here to protect and serve. So today we are here, we are challenging this shameful legacy, and we are demanding that our police departments in Los Angeles and around the country protect and serve the people instead of delivering extrajudicial and often lethal justice in the streets to black and brown people. Ezel Ford did not deserve to die in the streets of Los Angeles at the hands of two police department office, two LAPD officers. Um, Ezel Ford, like every person in the United States, has a right to life, has a right to be judged by his peers. And we are demanding that the two officers responsible for his murder be, first of all, fired, and second of all, charged and convicted. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Davon Williams, also from the Youth Justice Coalition, and I'm here to ask that all LAP, LAPD officers be held accountable for what they do in shooting our community members, in shooting our family, our friends. I had a cousin that was shot by LAPD three years ago, and I stand here today, have no justice for it, no anything. As we see many other cases, Isel Ford, so many other people, people from our coalition who have been shot by LAPD, and we see no justice for it. So I'm here to ask that you take accountability to it and push whoever is supposed to be that prosecutor to prosecute these officers, do that. I'm also asking that you redirect some of your money and invest in a community. Give 1%, which is equal to $100 million of your budget so that we can have 50 youth centers for that little girl right there when she grows up. We can have 25,000 youth jobs and 50 peace, uh, 500 peace builders and intervention workers who know how to work with our community and communicate better. And we're willing to teach you guys how to do that. We also have that training. Thank you. Thank you. The next five speakers, Dana Smith, Kim McGill, Yvonne Michelle Autry, Cindy Delgado, and Jose Gallegos. Um, hello, I am here in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and have been camped out here with them for close to two weeks now. I am just another person demanding that we end impunity for police and those with power. The community is demanding that two, the two officers who murdered Ezel Ford be charged with murder and that they be fired or suspended without pay. I urge the Board of Police Commissioners to follow their policy of community policing by pressuring DA Jackie Lacey to comply with these communities demands. To repeat, the demands are that Jackie Lacey file murder charges against officers who killed Ezel Ford and that these two officers be fired or suspended without pay. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Kim McGill. I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition. We've also been camping out as part of the Black Lives Matter delegation for the past two weeks. Um, in addition to the recommendations or the demands that people have already brought, we want to urge you to drop all charges against Shay Dixon and Melina Abdullah, the two women that were arrested outside as they were trying to deliver a letter to you, and to publicly apologize to them and their families. We want data to be released. We were um, um, suggested that we meet with Bustamante regarding the data we wanted. He told us that he can't release that data, that we need to come back to you. So we're urging you to meet with the Justice Coalition as soon as possible, so that we can set up a system where the community learns about the data in terms of um, what departments are responsible, what units, what officers, what the outcome is of your internal investigations within what you can and can't tell us um, according to the state's Board of Rights. We also want um, a serious opportunity to meet with you regarding our platform on police change. As people have already stated, the Youth Justice Coalition has buried a number of community members due to police use of force. Um, we've also experienced use of force directly, both in terms of our detention within jails and juvenile halls, as well as our stop and frisk on the street. 
And we feel like we have a lot of common sense solutions to what is not only troubling because it's leading lives lost in the streets of Los Angeles, but also leaves us as the number one city nationwide in the killing of people by law enforcement. LA County as a county now has 644 people killed since 2000. Not a single one of those people um, has had any prosecution of their case. Any justice they've gotten has come through the civil courts. We urge you to take a stand, not only with law enforcement, to stand up also for the rights of the people that you're here to serve and protect. Thank you. Sorry. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, hi, my name is Cindy, and I'm with the Youth Justice Coalition. I am here in support of ECL4 and other lives that have been taken away by the law enforcement, including C um, Susie Banga. She was only nine months. I ask um, that you get a special prosecutor to investigate and prosecute all police used by force. I don't know if you're aware that since 2000, 601 lives have been taken away by the law enforcement. And I ask um, Chef Beck, um, how much longer will you stay silent? It's time to speak up and, you know, do your job, protect and to serve. Thank you. And remember that for the wages of sin is death. Good morning, Board of Commission. My name is Jose Gallegos, I'm here with the Youth Justice Coalition, and in support not just of black lives, brown lives, white lives, but all lives, my life, your children's life, because um, I don't understand this. When it's black on black crime, black on brown, brown on brown, we don't get paid, leave with pay, you know? We get 50 with two life sentences, sometimes even 200 years with two life sentences. I don't understand that. Um, it sucks to say this. This is a bummer to say this. How Kim was mentioned in this 644. I don't know when I'll become 645, number 646. And I accepted to learn that. See, I used to be scared that I was going to get killed by one of my own community members, you know. But I'm scared now that every time gang unit, whether it's 77, Newton, Southwest, just for having my hands in my pocket or whatever, man, I feel like, I'm gonna be the next one, man, on this one of these headlines, you know. So um, I'm not trying to be a part of the problem because I've been there, done that. I'm trying to be a part of the solution. How can we sit there and be a part of the solution? Um, it's my dream, man. Before I die, how can I sit at the table with other youth to be a part of the solution? I'm sitting here to urge you guys, man. I know you guys can't do it, but the commission can urge District Attorney Jackie Lacy to push her to pick up charges for these two officers that murdered Ezell Ford. Thank you. Is that it? We have one more. Uh, thank you for an opportunity to speak. I know that multiple lists of uh, the victims of police brutality have already been read, but Again, just for the record, Michael Brown, Ferguson, Edsel Ford, Faith Hernandez, Margaret Mitchell, Trayvon Martin, Devon Jackson, Oscar Grant, Kendrick McDay, Melanie Pinnock, Tamir Rice, Tamisha Anderson. Hopefully we won't have to continue to add to this list. And I know this is a very sensitive issue like the brother just spoke because he's no longer uh, participating in a culture of crime in which he was born into. But I, I cannot reify or remind officers enough that need to serve and protect not to terrorize murder or continue to exterminate our people a uh, scripture psalms 32 37 verse 37 the wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and the needy and to slay such as be of upright conversation there's a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaw teeth are as knives to draw and to destroy and devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. I'm bringing the word to you to appeal to you on a spiritual level, beyond the racial level, beyond an economic impetus for the extermination of black people, people of color, so that there can be additional sensitivity trainings, uh, whatever is necessary, because I believe that more black lives and brown lives are in jeopardy and these are the ones that we only know about a few months ago a, a korean uh, prime minister criticized america 
because of the civil rights issues in this country that have yet to be abused while America is always, always accusing other countries of civil rights violations. Let's handle our business. Stop killing black people, poor people, people that are mentally challenged. I hope we don't have to continue every week to remind you again to serve and protect you. and not to harass, humiliate, destroy, and terrorize. Thank you. <clears throat> this concludes our public comment period. We are now on item number 10, closed session. The Board of Police Commissioners will now recess into closed session to discuss item number 10A1 in accordance with Government Code 54957. I'm Cindy, and I'm in Little Tokyo, and you're watching Channel 35, Your City, Your Channel. This is John Clayton standing in front of a classic World War II aircraft called a B-17. This particular B-17 is called Aluminum Overcrossed, and she is from the EAA based back in the eastern United States. In just a few moments, we'll be flying aboard this wonderful airplane, and we'll be going with Lieutenant Wes Koss, who was shot down in World War II.